many, many awards. In fact, I would take up the whole day if I had to list them all. But I think the biggest is the presidential recognition in Kenya called the Order of the Grand Warrior. And the latest awards are the Princeton in Africa Medal, that's for her contribution to wildlife conservation in Africa, and also Disruptive Zinnovator from the Tribeca Film Festival. Without further ado, Paula Kahumbu and Hope for the Elephants. Oh, And then also, just to elevate the stature after Paula's presentation, we will have Prince Albert II of Monaco addressing us. Uh, he obviously heading up a foundation <coughs> on climate change, biodiversity, and access to water, which he founded in 2006. Paula. Thank you, Bronwyn, and thank you, everyone, for attending this, I think, very important session. I know that uh, Africa doesn't always come across very positively in the international media. It's a continent known for conflicts, diseases, famine, uh, all kinds of negative things. But I'm, I'm an African, and I can tell you that Africa is a continent of greatness. In fact, Africa is a superpower when it comes to megafauna. We're the last continent on this planet that still has its full array of what we call megafauna, elephants, giraffes, hippos, rhinos, these gigantic animals which actually co-evolved with human beings on the planet. So you can imagine that it's very interesting that these animals have survived on a continent that is actually well known for being quite poor and maybe unable to deal with so many things. We've actually protected these extraordinary animals that are a global heritage. And why? I believe it's because we have an ancient, ancient relationship with these animals. It's not just because we evolved, it's in our DNA, it's also in our folklores and our stories. There is a tribe in Kenya and East Africa called the Maasai. They are pastoralists. And they have a story that goes that a bride was leaving home for the last time and walking off with her husband. Her father had told her, don't look back, don't show regret. But she did. She disobeyed her father and she looked back. And in that instant, she was cursed. And she began to turn into the first elephant. And this is why the Maasai believe that humans and elephants are related by blood. They believe that our spirits reside in elephants. And if the Maasai has come across a dead elephant on the savannah, they will stop and bless it by placing grass on the skull of that elephant. Grass is the most important part of their currency because they're pastoralists. And they believe that elephants would do the same for people. That if an elephant comes across a dead person, that elephant would stop and actually cover that person with bushes. And amazingly, scientists have actually seen this. Well, I'm a scientist. I studied elephants. I did my PhD at Princeton University. Like so many scientists, you know, spent decades poring over data, analyzing these incredible animals. What we're beginning to learn is that they are far more complex than anyone could have imagined. You probably all know that elephants have an incredible memory. They've got a brain many times larger than ours. They can hear from immense distances. If we were a herd of elephants in this room today, Elephants in clusters would be able to hear us. They wouldn't just hear us, they would know what we're saying, and they would know who's speaking. They don't just listen with their ears, they listen with their feet and their trunk. They're incredible. And every year we discover more and more amazing facts about elephants, and every year we begin to lose them. <laughs> One of the most amazing things to me is that uh, elephants are beloved everywhere in the world. We give our children little toy elephants, they're on our pajamas, they're on our books. We show our children films about elephants. And children around the world grow up with these extraordinary animals in their lives. Well, in Africa, we see millions of visitors flooding into the continent to experience elephants and wild animals for themselves. How many of you have been to Africa and have gone on a safari? That's great, amazing number of you. Those who haven't, I can assure you, come to Africa and you, your lives will be changed forever. It's really extraordinary to meet animals like elephants. It's almost like they can read into your mind. Well, I love elephants because they're so much like human beings. They live in families. They have matriarchs. Here's a matriarch photograph I took of her standing beside a baby, shading it from the sun while she dusts herself. That wasn't even her baby. That was another female's baby. She is an aunt, and she's <coughs> taking care of her sister's baby, and as soon as the sister rumbled and called for her baby, 
The matriarch nudged it with her foot gently, lifted it with her trunk, and the baby was taken to its mother. Elephants laugh, they, they uh, make tools, they're incredibly intelligent, they understand the landscape, and they grieve. They cry and they return to the dead elephants of their relatives. They touch the bones. Every single year they return and they touch the bones, especially the tusks. They're extraordinary. There are many secrets about elephants that I think we'll never understand. But as Africa develops, and it's developing at a massively rapid pace, people are moving to cities and we're disconnected from this great heritage of ours, these incredible animals. Very few Africans actually can go to our national parks anymore. And we're getting disconnected and we're losing touch with these extraordinary animals. This is the Tau Tu. He's one of Africa's largest tuskers. A few days after this photograph was taken, he was killed with a poison arrow. The poachers chose a poison arrow because it's silent. They couldn't be tracked. This poor elephant suffered for days before he fell. And as he was suffering, he was sending messages out to all the other elephants, telling them how much pain he was in and how much danger there was. Why? Because of the demand for ivory in countries half a world away, primarily in China, Japan, the Philippines, Thailand, and those countries. Because of the resurgence of the ivory trade as a result of a decision taken in 2000 and 2002, we have seen a catastrophic killing of elephants across the African continent. 30,000 elephants every year. That's one every 15 minutes. And as a result, we're seeing population declines in some of the most important areas. Tanzania has lost 76% of our elephants in just five years. The Congo, 90%. Sudan, 95%. Some countries have lost their elephants altogether. Well, in Kenya, we saw this happening and we predicted exactly what would happen the moment the ivory trade was reopened. We saw poaching begin to increase. In 2012, it peaked, and then it fell off. And it wasn't because our elephants had been decimated. It's because we took a national action. We launched a campaign which was driven by civil society in partnership with the government, as well as companies like Amarula, which is their icon is an elephant. We also involved the media and we created a massive message that these are our elephants and we want to defend them. There are seven steps to what we did. First, we used evidence. We didn't just gather data on the dead elephants across the savannas. We also went into all the courtrooms. I have 10 lawyers who went into courtrooms and tracked every single wildlife trial. And Kenya is the first country in the world to have a digital database of every single wildlife trial that gives us real-time data on what's happening in those trials. We mobilized thousands and thousands of people to join us on the streets to demand justice for wildlife. There is no leader in Kenya who can ignore the fact of thousands of people, especially youth and children, demanding justice for these extraordinary animals. Probably the most important thing that we did was we went to the media. We didn't just go to the newsrooms and tell these stories. We went to National Geographic, BBC, we went to Disney Nature, and we asked them to give back those films that are made about Africa's wildlife and allow us to share them for free to air across Kenya. It might surprise you to hear that those amazing award-winning documentaries that you all grew up on, they've never been seen in Africa. They weren't made for Africa. They were made for Western audiences. So what we did was we asked for those films to be shown back in Kenya. And then we went another step. We said, well, we actually want to tell our own stories. We got a crew together, we got a Kenyan narrator, and we went into the field to record and document our own people, our own heroes, our rangers at the front lines, our scientists, our communities, and tell their stories. And the amazing thing happened that we hadn't really anticipated. Five million Kenyans watch our TV show. We have twice as many viewers as National Geographic for our own local production. 40% of Kenyans say they want to volunteer for wildlife. And this has happened in just a space of two years. As a result of this, we've been able to uh, expand our shows across the whole country, bring them into classrooms. I think it's just completely transformed the national consciousness about wildlife and the environment. We cultivated political will. We didn't just go to our president, who is a great champion for elephants. We went to his wife, Margaret Kenyatta. She's a great matriarch in her own right, the only first lady in the world who is 
taking on a wildlife initiative. She's the patron of the Hands Off Our Elephants campaign. And Judy Wahungu, the Minister of Environment, who pushed through necessary regulations and new legislation to support this initiative. We supported new boots on the ground. I'm not talking about ordinary rangers just going into the national parks. I'm talking about elite forces from many different agencies working together at the borders, on the highways, in the parks, at the airports, and even at the seaports. And this has had a huge effect because it allows us to detect and arrest the criminals. We lobbied for the destruction of our ivory. I know for some people this looks a bit controversial. That's $15 million worth of ivory going up in flames, and it's not the only time Kenya has done it. Kenya has done this five times. But we believe that the only people who should wear ivory are elephants. And so that there is really no need to, to store or keep this ivory. We've destroyed it so that it will never, ever appear in any international market. You know, when a country, a poor country like Kenya, takes such a huge political stand, it's quite contagious. Many other countries have now done it, including the United States, France, Gabon, even Hong Kong and China. And we pushed through new laws. Kenya today has the most severe penalties in the world, and the proof is in the pudding. This is one of Kenya's most notorious wildlife traffickers. His name is Faisal Mohammed Ali. It took us seven months to arrest this man. It was a, if I tell you about the trial, you won't believe it's far too fantastic. Evidence went missing. Witnesses disappeared. But thank God to this campaign, we created so much awareness in the country and just a zero tolerance for criminals against wildlife that he was eventually convicted and jailed for 20 years. He's serving that sentence right now, and he's been fined $200,000. He was the very first ever ivory trafficker to be arrested and tried in a Kenyan court. And since then, we've had several more. As a result of that, poaching in Kenya has declined by nearly 90% in the last five years. And I'm so proud to have been part of the team that put together this strategy. So I would love to invite all of you to join me in Kenya, in Amboseli, where we have the world's most famous population of elephants. The Amboseli elephants are all named as individuals because they each have very special personalities. This is Tim. Tim is 49 years old. He is a, a super tusker, probably the biggest elephant left on this planet. He is um, so friendly, although he's massive, he's so friendly. When I go to Amboseli, if I see him and I call his name, he will turn his head to me and he'll even walk towards my car. Prince Albert, I would love to invite you to come and meet Tim. I'm sure that uh, that introduction would lead to a lifelong friendship. <laughs> but it's not enough to just save Kenya's elephants. As I told you, elephant poaching is happening across the entire continent. We're still losing elephants at a rate of 7% per year. And at that rate, elephants will be gone within our lifetimes from the wild. Within the next few decades, we could lose elephants from the wild. It's just a reality that's too, it's just impossible to accept, and we will not accept it. And this is why I'm here in Davos, is to really raise the level of urgency. We have to work together, and I believe that all the people in this room and the people here at Davos can work together to save this incredible iconic species. Can you imagine a day when the only elephants left on Earth are the ones in zoos, the ones on your mantelpiece, you know the little uh, carvings you have on the mantelpiece or, or on your children's pajamas. It would just be unbelievably awful. So there are three things that I think we can do. First, don't buy ivory. It's kind of obvious. Don't buy ivory, but I think we should go a bit further than that. We need to make sure that our governments ban ivory trade into perpetuity. So I'd want a quick show of hands. How many people would be willing to write to their ministers or their presidents and say, let's ban ivory into perpetuity? That's fantastic. So please do it, because I'm pretty sure that if your presidents and ministers get such a letter from you as members and people who are some of the most powerful people in the world, it would make a massive difference. Secondly, support the grassroots efforts. We have people on the ground risking their lives every single day. They're parts of government. Some of them are in NGOs and other organizations. They need support. So please do support them. If anyone wants to know of organizations that they're out there, I'm very happy to share that information with you. And third, I'd like you to consider joining us in what we're doing in terms of creating global awareness. A Wildlife Direct, we discovered that telling the stories about elephants and wildlife to Africans, not just the stories that are made by BBC, like David Attenborough, he's fantastic, we love him. But when you tell a story by a local person, 
to their own people, it has a magical effect. We have mobilized millions of conservation champions in Kenya. We call ourselves wildlife warriors. And I think we need to go way beyond Kenya. We need to take this initiative across the continent and to Asia, where the demand is, and probably across the whole world. We need everybody in the world to know about elephants, to understand them, to care about them enough that they will actually take actions. I'd love to work with all of you to make this possible. I'm working with National Geographic, who have agreed to help me to scale this project. Uh, and I, I really wish that we could all work together to make this possible. Thank you. Your passion is amazing, absolutely amazing. <laughs> thank you. And a very difficult act to follow. So, thank you very much. We now are going to call on His Serene Highness, Prince Albert II of Monaco, to address us. Prince Albert founded a foundation, as I said earlier, in 2006, focusing on climate change, on biodiversity, and on access to water. So it's a privilege to have you here. It's a privilege to ask you to take the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ronan and Paula. Uh, it's a, uh, and ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, uh, uh, it's a pleasure to see you all here. I'm sorry I got uh, caught up in the traffic uh, halt due to President Trump's arrival, so uh, <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Anyway, it's, uh, it's, very difficult, it's a very difficult uh, uh, task for me to come after Paula Kahumbu uh, to speak on this subject and that she knows uh, more about, I think, than anyone else, not only in this room, but uh, anyone else pro possibly around the globe. Um, and uh, the, the subject that has that she's made part of her life uh, and having done so much and having given so much to the cause of protecting elephants and, and uh, trying to ban ivory uh, and uh, has you've brought so much to the to raise the the awareness uh, on elephants uh, plight uh, so thank you so much for uh, for that and thank you for having me but um, we, we, we need ambassadors uh, like you are, uh, talented and persuasive, but most of all, we, we have to convince, all of us, we have to convince people to drum up as much energy as possible in support of the elephant and more widely in the preservation of biodiversity as a whole. Uh, that is the tenure of our discussion here today, I think, that the need to work collectively to move uh, forward together embracing a shared cause. The cause is one of the elephants, of course, but uh, through them, uh, other species and uh, the essential uh, uh, essence and, and, and need for uh, the protection of biodiversity, which th throughout our planet is under threat. And I don't think we can afford to, to lose many more species. So I'd like to remind everyone that according to the IUCN, 41% of amphibians, 13% of birds, and 25% of mammals are at risk of extinction worldwide. I don't know if you gave those figures in the beginning of your talk, but I think it's important to, to remind everybody. A recent UK study showed that almost 80% of winged insects have disappeared in Europe in the period of 30 years. Most of these dramas are silent. There may be as many of us present here today worrying about elephants, but who is concerned over the future of the monk seal in the Mediterranean? Who's worried about the dwindling numbers of Lepidoptera? And who is going to take action to save the last of the bald ibis? In this sense, elephants play a particularly valuable role as sentinels because they arouse our attention and our affection and because they make their presence noticed, and equally, their absence. The, 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 the real danger that threatens elephants, and likewise other species, stems from the same cause, which is human activities. 
the, the cause lies in the customs that still today in some countries attach a great value to, to, to the use of ivory. It also, of course, lies in a tendency to undervalue the lives of other species. And it lies above all, and this is becoming increasingly clear, uh, in our difficulty in sharing our land, our planet, that is common to all species. And in this respect, the, the conservation of elephants helps us to see the underlying mechanisms that lead us humans to, to, to destroy so many species and so many ecosystems that are nonetheless uh, vital to us. It also helps us to determine solutions to end this carnage. And these solutions d do exist, as I'm sure you've indicated, Paula, they are essentially cross-border solutions. And they include, to begin with, the instigation of more valuable, uh, more favorable global conditions, including greater individual knowledge and awareness, and above all, the development of a more sustainable economy, and, and, and in particular, farming methods that use less land. There's the fight against poaching, this global scourge, and the ban that, that this banditry that thrives at the expense of our common heritage. This is a cause that must bring us all together. And I want to pay tribute here to all those heroes who, on the ground, give their time, their energy, and sometimes, unfortunately, their, their lives uh, to, to, to this battle that must continually be fought. Unfortunately, the fight against poaching will not be enough to save the elephant unless it goes hand in hand with wider measures. And I refer to even stricter regulations on international trade or on monitoring and guidance programs based on precise scientific expertise. There, there's also the implementation of conservation zones, which are the only real way to, to enable animal species and human communities to coexist by organizing the sharing of, of resources in a sustainable way and by developing appropriate solutions. These conservation measures prove their effectiveness, I think, and have proven their effectiveness almost everywhere, both from terrestrial, but also from marine species. And I'm particularly well acquainted with the case of marine protected areas. These measures, which, which we must now develop on a bigger scale, enable us to preserve complete ecosystems and put in place global solutions beyond measures aimed at individual and particular species. This, I believe, is one of the best answers to the risk that, that I alluded to just now, the risk of choosing to focus on a small number of animals that are more visible, more iconic. Through them, we should, in fact, organize a new sharing of nature. We should not be drawing imaginary boundaries but, but between areas that are to be preserved for humans and others that are to be the province of wildlife. We must, we must allow some interaction, exchange, evolution, but, but always favor the priority on preserving ecosystems and protecting endangered species on, on I, I'm <clears throat> excuse me, on reconciling the development of mankind with that of nature upon which we all depend. It represents a huge task, which requires, of course, our energy, our resources, and our ability to take decisions and exert our influence. It calls for, for, the, for the political will to innovate. It calls for, for the economic resources to gain acceptance of different restrictions but it also calls for human resources in monitoring and management. <coughs> Excuse me. So I believe it was necessary to stress these points before we begin our wider discussion. I thank you so much for being here and sharing these concerns. And uh, again, thank you so much, Paula, for, for your incredible work and, and the inspiration that you've uh, incited into others that uh, share your common concerns. Thank you very much. So I'll be the second of Monica. Thank you very much, sir.
Paula, if I could ask you to come up onto the stage and join me. We've got questions coming through. This technology is fantastic. So it's very easy to get into the mind of the audience and find out exactly what you want to know from Paula. But I do just want to say, as a media player across the African continent, or as a representative of a media player across the African continent, that being CNBC Africa, I'd like to show solidarity. And Paula, you have my support. We'll work together to change the media landscape to tell your story. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bronwyn. Right, so the questions are, having studied elephants, how do they feel about their living conditions in zoos and domestication in Asia? Ooh, that's a, that's a heavy one. It's, um, it's another major issue. I think I wouldn't, I don't even need to think. It's like uh, being in a jail, right? being in a zoo or being incarcerated or being forced to work. Uh, it, I think elephants are so intelligent. We wouldn't put a human being behind bars. Why would we put an animal that is just as sentient as us and probably much more aware of its surroundings than we are of our own? Well, we've already taken the audience on a myriad of emotions. So can you tell us a funny story about an elephant? <laughs> oh, I'll tell you a very funny story. Recently, I was in... Samburu National Park. I know the elephants of Amboseli. I, I've spent a lot of time with them. But I went to Samburu, different population. I had the US ambassador in my car. And I said to him, don't worry, the ele elephants are fine. They'll come right up to the car, it's no problem. And we're sitting in the car, and a huge bull walked right up to my car. And I said to everyone in my car, it's OK, it's cool. And this elephant put his head against my windshield and started nudging my car with his tusks. <laughs> I had a very tiny little Land Rover. And I had this image of the car flying. Um, anyway, I managed to somehow extricate myself from this elephant after about 30 seconds. I took a photograph of him, and I sent it to Ian Douglas Hamilton from Save the Elephants. They do phenomenal work out there. And he said, oh, congratulations. You've met Anwar. He loves cars. <laughs> <laughs> and he likes to hug them. <laughs> That's a relief. So, Paula, your work is so effective, but people still ask, a Chinese ban is good news. Yes. But how can it possibly be enforced? So, first to say that we are thrilled that China did take the action to ban the ivory trade. They announced it a year in advance. It's just come into effect. The price of ivory tumbled by 50%. But ivory prices had already reached $3,000 per kilogram. So, that is up from about $50 per kilogram before the sales of ivory took place. Well, for somebody on the ground, the profitability at $1,500 per kilogram or even $1,000 per kilogram is still worth it. Poaching will still continue. It's very, very difficult to enforce. That's why I believe that we have to take footage and stories of those heroes on the ground. They're not just African heroes for Africa. They're African heroes for a global heritage. We have to get Chinese people to come to Africa and meet these animals and fall in love with them as well and go back and share that love. I do think that the only way that we're going to change behavior is when people really, truly understand. If you think about the number of containers that go into the Chinese ports every year, it's impossible for them to search every single container. Obviously, the government can make more statements about it. I would call on the president, Xi Jinping, to make a personal statement and appeal to his people to say, don't buy ivory. We know that even though you can't buy ivory in the shops anymore, you can still buy it online, and that's going on all over the world. So I know that I've been to China, spent a whole month there. People in China are very law-abiding. They don't want to do something that they're not supposed to do. So I do think a message from the president will make a huge impact. So you have a deep-seated love for elephants. <laughs> you have a passion for them. But do you have hope for them? So Kenya is the home of the last three northern white rhinos in the world. This is, I don't know if any of you have seen the pictures. They are a magnificent species which is literally going extinct before our eyes. And it's very hard to imagine that that is where elephants are going. I do have hope for elephants. Unlike rhinos, which are really hard to get too uh, close and comfortable with, uh, elephants, <laughs> I mean, they really, they're a bit like dinosaurs. Elephants are, are so easy to relate to. We, we, can, we can see ourselves in them. And they can 
interact with us in a way that makes us feel awe and wonder. And so I do, th I do have hope for elephants. I, I just think we have to do a lot more work on bringing them to every single person on this planet. I do just need to do a time check. Uh, how long do I have? Excellent. We've got 15 minutes left, so we can really deep dive right. into the conversation. Should I continue spending money on the corridors or better spent on anti-poaching? So, as, as Prince Albert said earlier, we need a myriad of different approaches. Right now, it's like saying, I've cut my arm, I'm bleeding. Uh, should I go and... Um, do something else or shall I just deal with the bleed, bleeding right now? You've got to deal with the bleeding. You've got to do anti-poaching. There's no question. But the future for elephants is going to depend on large, large landscapes, interconnected. Elephants need to move over thousands of square kilometers. So corridors are vital and they do need to be put down now because as human populations grow, uh, we lose the options in the future. So both things have to happen. What surprised you most in your study of the elephants, the elephants? I think what surprises me the most about elephants is how they can read people. I've, I've had extraordinary experiences where elephants will, even when I'm on foot, come very close to me and never threatened me. They seem to know who are the good guys and who are not the good guys. They're playful. They're just... They're, they're just, they're, every single day, I could spend hours watching elephants. I, I cannot get bored with them. So, I mean, every single day is full of surprises. You spoke of the uh, civil society action within Kenya and the deep-seated, again, I use the word passion, that Kenyans have yes. for elephants. And that, that really trans, uh, reached the top, the leaders. Yes. How can we, and I'm thinking here from a media perspective, how can we gather widespread public support across the globe? Yes, we'll use our media platforms. Mm -hmm. Education, how can we make people understand that these creatures are magical? So I think it's really simple. What worked in Kenya is not just lecturing to people. Obviously, information is important. It's giving people a chance to participate and do something meaningful. Kenya is not a rich country. When I say about 50% of Kenyans want to volunteer for wildlife, these are people earning less than $200 a month. Everyone says, you know, poor people, they've got all these other priorities. Well, the truth is, when you can do something meaningful and make a difference, it's worth more than any amount of money. And so I think we need to create opportunities for people to participate, take actions, and know that they're making a difference. And I, then I think everybody around the world would want to be part of this. In addition to anti-poaching anti policies, what other policies can help the world protect the elephant population? Uh, again, I think that uh, the real challenge in Africa is poverty. People live with elephants in their landscapes. Those people don't benefit from elephants, and elephants can also destroy their crops, can cause great risks and costs to people. So I think we need to come up with new and innovative strategies to enable people on the ground to benefit from this wildlife. And I think there are many different ways. You know, it's, it's not just the same old, same old tourism. It's got to be local people get to find ways of participating. When we started our TV series, we found that we were the only Africans in the entire continent of two million people in the film industry, we were the only Africans making wildlife documentaries in the continent. So, I mean, there is a huge opportunity. All these amazing young people who are in film, they should be out there with us, taking, make, making documentaries about wildlife as well. The recently launched Great Elephant Census, how has that uh, added to cross-border collaboration and helping the plight of the elephant? So the, the recent surveys of elephants across the continent, and there are many, but that particular one is, is quite vital, provides the information that's never been there before. The information that allows governments to make decisions and actually to collaborate across borders. But I have to say, there's so much work still to be done. We cannot save elephants one country at a time. And we also can't just save elephants in Africa. It's going to take a global effort. Uh, the, the data is critical because it provides that baseline. It allows us to see how well or not our interventions are having an impact. 
Let's talk about that data for a moment. You put a number of really shocking stats up during your presentation. How long before elephants are extinct if we continue to see the same rate of poaching? So I predict that what will happen if we don't do anything, what will happen to elephants is what's happened to rhinos. The populations will shrink, they will blink out, because they will reach a certain point and then they just cannot survive anymore and they'll collapse. So for every elephant poached, a whole family is traumatized. Poachers go for the biggest individuals. Those are the individuals who have the memory of the whole clan and the whole society. So you're left with little traumatized delinquents. So you have elephants, the populations will drop like that and then they'll collapse. And this is happening all across the continent. We'll be left with little pockets. Botswana has a very large population, so we'll have a nice little pocket there. We'll have a pocket in Kenya, maybe a little bit in Tanzania. But we'll just be left with these little isolated sanctuaries, which is actually what the current situation is for rhinos. I said we were going to deep dive into the subject. If elephants are like humans, have they taught you anything about why humans are so cruel? About why humans are so cruel? No, but I think it's fascinating that uh, people in Kenya, especially the Maasai, believe that we should aspire to be like elephants. Elephants don't wage wars. They hardly fight with each other. They're not even all that territorial. They solve their problems somehow without um, massive you know, conflict. I don't know why people are so cruel. I, I really can't figure that I out. I don't think there's an easy answer to that. Yeah. But let me ask you another one. Being, coming from South Africa, what can we learn from you given the crisis that we've seen, you referred to the crisis um, that we've seen unfolding on the rhinos. Right. What can we learn? We cannot save elephants when countries in Southern Africa have a totally different policy view to countries in other parts of Africa. It was this one-off sale of ivory that took place in 2002 and again in 2008 that actually caused this catastrophic uh, eruption of poaching and triggered this new demand for ivory. I think the one thing we have to learn is that Africa has to stand together. We need to really work together. We need to say there is a red line. There are some species you just will never, never trade. It's our heritage and it's our identity. Can I, can I add to that? Africa and the world need to stand together on this. Yes, well, you know, if Africa went into the CITES convention with a unified position, the world would have supported a ban on trade in ivory, but we didn't. We went into the last few CITES conventions with totally opposing views, and it was the European Union that chose to not vote that led to the decision to allow the trade in ivory. Is your work contained to elephants? No. I, um, I do a lot of work in, in many different areas. I mean, elephants are such a great flagship, right? If you save elephants, you can save so many species, but it's people <laughs> that we need to get on board as well. We, I do, and my t I have a phenomenal team in Kenya. We do a lot of work in classrooms and taking children into the parks. And while I'm here in Davos, my team are out in Samburu with 30 children counting zebras using technology. So we do a lot of work bringing people into conservation through all kinds of different ways, whether it's art or science. We work with local communities as well on enterprise options so that they can benefit from wildlife and the connection of their tradition and culture to, to nature and conservation. And a, a fitting question given that uh, US President Donald Trump has just arrived. I'm sorry that he made you late. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, how can we persuade the US to do the right thing and finalize the trophy import ban? So I think it's really amazing that Donald Trump threatened to lift the ban on the importation of trophies. These are hunting trophies. This is not poaching and it's not ivory trade. Hunting trophies. And the reaction in the United States was so overwhelming that he withdrew that decision. I think it's the only decision he has publicly withdrawn. So that is the power of elephants, really. It is the power of elephants. And so I do think... <laughs> I do think that Americans have it right. It doesn't matter whether you're Republican or independent or a Democrat. Uh, elephants are, are special to everybody. And obviously, they're very special to the people in this room. So where can the dollars be spent? Gosh, I would, I would love for the people in the room to think about the project that I've just out outlined. 
the missing link for me is awareness in Africa, bringing wildlife documentaries to the people of Africa on free-to-air documentaries, television and in classrooms. It is, we're not talking about you know, billions of dollars. We're talking of about the $8 million that we need to raise to do a project to create awareness across the continent for the next few decades. It's not a one-off thing. We've had tremendous success in Kenya. I know it can work across the continent. So that's what I hope that people in this room would be willing to partner with us on. And I am going to say again that this is the first time that wildlife crime has appeared on the agenda to this extent here at Davos. So congratulations to the World Economic Forum. But we're not going to stop there. What else can the World Economic Forum do for you? I think the, um, gosh, I don't, I don't know. I, I came here with a very open mind. I've met some extraordinary people who do amazing, amazing things. Um, I see animals from Africa on all kinds of products. Even the water we're drinking has gorillas on it. I don't know if you guys have noticed that. There's a gorilla on the water that, uh, that is being served around here. These are African animals, yeah. These are African animals. And I don't think people realize that uh, we are in a way exploiting something that is so special and we're forgetting that we're losing these species. What if the World Economic Forum persuaded all the companies that use animals in their logos to put something aside and create a global trust fund that would perhaps be invested somewhere and raised enough money on an annual basis to support all those struggling protected areas across Africa, all those grassroots conservation organizations, and all those people who live every day with wildlife. We, we will have to find a way uh, to save people and wildlife together. Well, I'm sure everybody felt a sense of camaraderie, and they were touched by Tim when you introduced him to us. Tell us a little bit more about Tim. This is your closing comment, because right. I want everyone here to take that story out. I think it's the best way to capture what Paul is doing and uh, leave us with a sense of hope. Well, when I first met Tim, I was teaching an undergraduate course to Princeton University students. And he literally did walk right up to my car. I took a photograph of him, had him identified by the Amboseli Trust for Elephants, run by Cynthia Moss, very famous project. And um, we decided that Tim was the guy that we were going to tell stories about. We started a campaign called Save Tim. And a lot of people said, what are you doing? Why are you sharing photographs of this spectacular elephant? You're just going to attract poachers. And I said, I don't want to get into a situation that we did with Satao. Satao died before anybody knew he existed. Just the same way that Cecil the lion was killed before anybody knew he existed. And the whole world was grieving for these two animals, but they never got to meet them in real life. So one of the most important things to me is to raise awareness about these animals, not as just a species and about thousands of animals and all these statistics. These are individuals. They have personalities. Tim came into a camp when I had my board meeting in Amboseli, and he had an injury on his hip. My board, who are largely Americans, felt that he was coming to tell them a message. And within a week, we had raised enough money to put a radio collar on him, and he's now one of the best protected elephants in Africa. And I think that's the, the real power of elephants. They are individuals. We can tell their stories. We can partner with corporates and sponsor these individual giant tuskers who represent really the future of the entire species. Dr. Paula Kohumbu, thank you very much for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your interaction.